Caitlin, what are you doing? Just polishing my unicorn. Hello and welcome to For Your Reference, brought to you by the Council on Library and Information Resources. I'm Robin. I'm Paris. And I'm Joshua. And this is yet another show where we're going to be talking about some pretty dark stuff. Uh, this time we'll be talking with our guest about media portrayals of, of violence against women, so be <laughs> warned. Um, so y'all, I, I sense that I have been consuming media for a lot longer than either of you. <laughs> and uh, yeah. in fact, before diving back into academia, um, I worked in journalism for a number of years. And what I wonder is, have either of you had the sense that the media, whatever we mean by the phrase the media anymore, um, has been in a downward spiral, spiral through your whole lives uh, or has it always just seemed terrible? <laughs> That's funny. Um, this is what I'll say. Um, so as, uh, as a millennial, you know, we do remember a time without like instant connection to media and the outside world without, um, without effort. Like we had to put the effort in in order to contact them. But in today's digital landscape and as an information professional, I feel way more empowered than ever to really like filter and choose my media intake. So like this constant barrage of information with like the 24 hour news cycle, agenda setting, all those constant updates make it really difficult for me to stay engaged. And um, I think mostly everybody knows about information overload at this point. So that's where um, I was for a while. So with that being said, now I've really had to employ some tools to kind of help filter my news intake. So I guess in a way that's saying there's a downward spiral. spiral. What about you, Joshua? <laughs> yeah, no, um, agree with all of that. Um, at the same time, I my academic work in a past life was on 19th century newspapers, and uh, that was its own kind of special. Uh, so a lot of what feels really new right now, even like fake news, um, 19th century had it down already. Um, so. <laughs> It does feel like a downward spiral, but maybe if I had to compare it, it would be more like one step forward, two te steps back. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Or everything old is new again. So mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, I, I remember working in a newsroom in the 90s uh, when they were actually, journalists were discovering um, and editors of newspapers were discovering that they could uh, analyze readership, not just by pure high level circulation numbers, but really down at the article level. Um, and I have a lot of stories and opinions about how that changed some editorial decision making. Uh, and there's a whole actual line of research that revolves around that, which is a little bit different than the criticism of the media we'll be undergoing today with our very special guest. This is Reviewer 2. Welcome to Reviewer 2, where we invite scholars on the show to ask them questions about their work, hopefully in a productive way and not a soul-destroying way. Our guest today is Dr. Leah Hernandez. She is Assistant Professor of Journalism, Race, News, and Community in the Department of Communication at the University of Utah. Welcome to the show. Awesome. Thank you all for having me here. I I'm so excited to be with y'all today. And I really appreciated the conversation leading into our time together, particularly because many of us, as we know, we research things because we really love them, we really hate them, or both. And I'm kind of at the intersection <laughs> there in the middle. Um, and also, I used to work in news too. Uh, when I was much younger, I desperately wanted to be a news anchor and I would run around all the time with my little microphone pretending like I was <laughs> doing cute. broadcast. Yeah, you, I mean, you could probably imagine the shenanigans that happened there. And my mom was like, okay, we get it. What's going on in the world today? But then when I first worked in a news station, I wasn't a reporter. I wasn't an anchor. I was an assignments editor. And what's the best way mm -hmm. to learn about a news station and also kill your soul? Then be an assignments editor right at the height of the recession when news stations are 
understaffed and underemployed and you're working in the Houston market with not as many people as you need to help you kind of just figure out what's going on in the world. So yeah, those are some of my humble origins in news. And now much later, I'm kind of on the other side, researching it, working on um, trauma-informed journalism approaches for news professionals and trying to help our younger generation make sense of what's going on and also ourselves, right? Right. So can you give us a sort of a deeper overview of what um, what exactly you're exploring in your research? Yeah, so the narrow down version is um, I research the ways in which gender violence and reproductive justice and injustice are represented in the news broadly defined. But within that, I'm really looking at considerations associated with media ethics, objectivity, um, culturally informed and trauma informed news reporting approaches. And then also at the end of the day, how does all of this help larger audiences make sense of what's going on in the world currently? Okay. So uh, you've described the way you approach your work as something of a, a kitchen sink approach, a kitchen sink method. Uh, can you yeah. talk to us a little bit about that? I, I, that sounded very familiar to me uh, in, in the way that I work. And, um, yes. Why yeah, use so one we, theory when you can use four? <laughs> exactly. And why use one topic when you can research four other ones, right? All at the same right. time. Um, so the kitchen sink approach always worked for me because I think it's how I've always seen the world. So from a positionality perspective, um, you know, as a queer Latina with multiple generational identities, thinking about how my family didn't cross the border, but the border crossed us, right? I could never only see the world or anything I was experiencing through one lens. So when I got much older and I discovered um, Chicana feminist theories, Black feminist theories, intersectionality, it really helped me see the world and my research in a more multifaceted way. So in the communication discipline, Robin, as you know, um, historically, our field was very much steeped in traditional canons like other disciplines, also very um, detached kind of quantitative approaches to learning how the world works. And that didn't jive with my experience or my research interest at all. So when I was in graduate school, I wanted to talk about um, topics at the intersections of health communication and the mass media, but I couldn't just use traditional journalism theories. I couldn't just use traditional health communication theories because it wasn't helping me make sense of what I wanted to research. And also when you think about it, um, theories and frameworks like intersectionality, borderland studies, reproductive justice, they are not traditionally housed in the communication discipline anyways. So it was always harder for me when I was younger trying to find my way in the research world when you have a very supportive committee who is trained in a very particular sort of like set of approaches and they say, we don't exactly know what you wanna do yet, but we're gonna do our best to help you get there, right? And uh, right. thankfully I had that kind of a committee because I know not everyone else did, but it's literally taken me about 10 years to finally get a handle on the different areas, theories, and frameworks I could use to study things like media representation, gender violence, and reproductive issues. You, <clears throat> sorry, so you mentioned uh, borderland studies. Uh, I know in Saldua has been um, a big part of how you've been framing some of your work, uh, but there are a couple terms that I wanted to throw out there because they're contentious, because they're so situated um, and they're culturally specific um, and chronologically specific. And those are Hispanic, uh, Latino, Latina, Latinx, um, and Chicano, Chicana, uh, Chicanx. Right? Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about how, how you're defining those terms in your work um, and how do you how do you communicate to your audience uh, what those terms mean? Why are they valuable? Why um, they're in a conversation instead of simply saying you know, people of color or people from Latin America or immigrants? Yeah, that's such a great question too. Um, and it reminds me of my intercultural communication class that I had this past semester where at the very start of the semester, I had students read an article by a scholar in our field. Her name's Yao Wen Chen. She's a prolific author, 
um, Asian American scholar, and the entire chapter focused on names. And I didn't fully understand how significant that chapter or that topic would be for my students because it's one they brought up themselves constantly over the course of the semester because they had never really thought about any of this, right? And let's be honest, I live in Utah, which has a different sort of political, cultural, religious landscape than other states where I've lived. Um, but when you kind of compare that to Hispanic, Latino, Chicano, Raza, Latina, Latinx, and so on and so forth, I always tell people they're significant because names are political, right? Especially when we think about the names that we have the freedom to give ourselves or the identities we have the freedom to give ourselves versus those that are imposed upon us. Um, and it's something I didn't have the criticality to think about much until I was much older. So for example, um, in my own sort of um, background and identity, I was born and raised in Texas. My mom's family has been there for generations since it was technically more northern Mexico, pre-Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. So from my mom's side, she very much sees herself as Hispanic, Tejana, like a regional um, cultural identifier. My dad, however, um, as a first generation Mexican-American himself, sees himself more as Mexican-American or even like Raza or Chicano for being closely politi uh, politically affiliated with a lot of the activist efforts from the 1960s on out. So I always used to tell people I was Hispanic, not really knowing where the term came from or what it meant until I started to realize that the word Hispanic was created by the U.S. government for our communities and that it really emphasizes links to um, Spanish ancestry or even the Spanish language. And granted, right, like two of my grandfathers have Spanish heritage too, so identities are murky and so on and so forth. But I started to realize that Hispanic wasn't really my jam. It didn't fully encapsulate how I felt ethnically. And then when I really started getting into Chicana feminisms and Chicana writers like Gloria Anzaldúa, like you mentioned, Sherry Moraga, Ana Castillo, a whole host of them doing incredible work, I think that's really when I started to see myself represented, especially in Gloria Anzaldúa's works, because she was born and raised in the Texas borderlands herself. So you have all of these terms, and then Latino, which uh, privileges more relationships to or heritages in Latin American countries. But as we know, the Spanish language is heavily gendered, masculine, feminine. So you have Latino or Latina, but then all of the queer kids say, where do we fit in this? Especially <laughs> transgender and non-binary folks who feel that the A and the O don't represent them. And that's where we have Latinx and Latine, and the identities go on and on. So it's really funny to see um, how older generations, like my parents, for example, see this, because my dad always says, I don't understand why there's an X or why there's an E. You would never say, yo soy Latinx in conversation, right? He says, that just sounds weird. And then I try to help him understand, right? Like identities have always existed that weren't always as present, which relates to things we'll talk about later. Um, and then we have Chicano, which again, kind of relates to having a more politicized Latino identity. So at the end of the day, the terms keep going and they keep evolving. And I think that just goes to show how complex language is and how complex our identities are too. Do you mind if I ask you a follow-up question? Um, as a US citizen, but a non white um, coming from Latin America and the Caribbean and coming from speaking in Spanish. Um, one of the really interesting things has been to look at scholarship um, in the US and seeing this shift towards Latinx, towards being more inclusive, uh, but also noticing that there's some absences of it going the other way. Latin American and Caribbean scholars writing about these topics uh, not situated in the U.S., but not necessarily being reflected in the academic discourses mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. Latin immigrants, um, Hispanic immigrants. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, you touch on Anseldua, which has been essential for you know, understanding Latin America generally in contemporary times, right? Um, have you had that experience in your work of engaging with scholars outside of the U.S.? Um, seeing how those terms um, are wrestled with, uh, specifically within the realm of reproductive justice, um, women's rights, immigrant rights. 
Yeah, that's such a great question, too, because that's that's one of the central critiques of Latinx, right, or Latinx, however an individual wants to pronounce it, because um, many folks say that that's an American academic obsession with the term. Um, I even have family in Mexico and in other places and different scholars that I've worked with throughout Latin America who say that Latinx is not necessarily a term that many of them would use. It's not necessarily a term that many of them would come up with, that there are different identities there. And I even remember talking to one of my cousins in Mexico not too long ago where she says, I feel like people in the U.S. have so much more of an obsession with this, right, than we might have here in Mexico, just based on our own upbringing and what we've experienced. And I really do feel that in some of these areas, um, American scholars especially need to do a better job engaging with and working with transnational scholars who are doing similar parallel work, yet not always cited as much or not always included as much in the conversation, because a lot of American scholarship tends to focus on topics that other American scholars are working on, right? Which is why um, in a lot of my work, especially when thinking about reproductive justice, um, most of the work that I've cited so far comes from uh, Mexican feminists who have really created the typology on femicide. But in my experience, like in working with other scholars in sociology or other disciplines, they very much focus on femicide scholarship from the US, not the transnational femicide feminicidial scholarship that we see happening very powerfully um, in different countries in Latin America. So yeah, it's definitely a huge critique and concern. Yeah, so, <clears throat> excuse me, a term that's come up uh, uh, a few times uh, and one that's evocative for me and uh, one of the reasons uh, uh, I love having you in my circle, I had never heard it before, <laughs> reproductive justice. Uh, ah. my, my, my scholarship is so far outside of, of what you do, um, but I think, uh, could, you, could you talk a little bit more about sort of the, the foundation of that and what it means and why it should be more interesting to people if if they don't find yeah. it as evocative as I do. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I feel the same way, right? When I first discovered what reproductive justice was, that's when I realized that there were frameworks outside of what we traditionally see in the mass media or in general academic scholarship that help us understand the full spectrum of the reproductive experience. Um, so my dissertation, for example, focused on um, genetic testing and prenatal testing for Hispanic Latina populations. But so much of the research at that time said, oh, Latinas are all Catholic. Therefore, um, they won't want to even talk about abortions because they're all going to be Catholic and so on and so forth. It was kind of singular and very reductive. And I remember thinking when I was doing my interviews and talking to different women and healthcare providers that that wasn't the case at all. And reproductive justice helps us explain one part of that and so much more, right? So um, reproductive justice as a framework, an area of activism is really rooted in Black feminist scholarship and Black feminist activism. And um, it also helps us expand pro-choice, pro-life debates to really focus on reproductive health care across the lifespan. And it's not even just for women. It's thinking about the safety of the family, the ability for individuals to make their own reproductive choices and decisions free from government intervention, violence, environmental toxins, threats to safety, so on and so forth. Um, and as we know, just based on American history, communities of color have long faced reproductive injustices, I mean, as far back as we can go, right? Whether you're thinking about um, putting Native American indigenous children in boarding schools, um, separating slave families, um, whether or not we're thinking about um, sterilizing Latinas across the U.S. and in Puerto Rico against their will and so on and so forth. Like the list of injustices is there in our history. And reproductive justice, on the other hand, helps us understand like how amazing it can be and how fulfilling it can be when individuals are able to exercise their human rights to make their decisions free from all of these issues, right? Mm -hmm. And that helped me understand too, in a better way, what reproductive activism looks like, right? Because when I was younger, I was born and raised in a Catholic household. And for us, the number one conversation was always abortion, right? Like we want to go protest at Planned Parenthoods. 
Um, we want to understand that conception is the start of life and so on and so forth. But there were never any other conversations about maternal health care, maternal mortality rates, like the full experience of child care or the decision to not have a family outside of that. And that is also mirrored in the media, too, particularly when you think about um, like when you think about the framing of Roe v. Wade and how historically news discourses almost always just focus singularly on abortion, not on anything else. And abortion is important, of course, but as black feminists, reproductive justice activists, um, other scholars and activists have shown us, it's about so much more than just that, right? Whether you make the decision to want to have 10 children or none at all, um, reproductive justice essentially argues that that is a human right and that we should be able to exercise our choices and have access to the health care that we need accordingly. Yeah, thank you. Um, speaking of Roe v. Wade and injustices, um, in your work, you talk about violence against women of color and how it's covered significantly less by the media. And the term used here is symbolic annihilation. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, yeah. So symbolic annihilation is um, a media theory, a media framework that details how uh, minoritized communities are essentially trivialized, demonized, or not represented at all in the media, right? Whether we're thinking about queer communities, communities of color, so on and so forth, the understanding here is that minoritized communities are symbolically annihilated and disempowered when we can't have narratives or news coverage in the media that fully represent or encapsulate our experiences. And sometimes in classes with students, when we talk about this, they're like, things are so much better now. Look at the movie Black Panther, right? We don't have to worry about <laughs> symbolic annihilation anymore. I know, your face is my face. And I'm just like, oh my dudes. No. We, let, let's, no. Spend <laughs> some time here, right? Um, and it's, it's not even just in pop culture frameworks too, right? When you think about how minoritized communities are also represented in the news, the findings are very similar there as well. And not only is it disempowering for the communities at the center of the stories or the coverage, mm -hmm. but it also has deleterious effects when you think about how the larger American public doesn't understand or have access to fulfilling coherent narratives either. So when it comes to violence against women, more specifically, Decades of research have documented how problematic traditional historical news coverage was of violence against women, that it overwhelmingly focused on white women, especially when white women were kind of constructed as the good victim, the victim we need to cover, the victim around which we need to rally. Then when you think about how considerations of blame and culpability are oftentimes framed in the media too, right? Well, was she out at night? What was she wearing? What was going on? And that was also, um, just as an example, really present in the Brock Turner case and the associated coverage at that time. Then when you think about the sources of information who are included as experts in the news coverage, oftentimes the sources included um, public information officers or police officers, never um, local domestic violence advocates, local experts, or the survivor or the families themselves, if they wanted to be included, and on and on and on. Um, and even coming from Utah, one case that I always use with my students is the case of Gabby Petito. Do y'all remember hearing about that? Yeah. 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 So um, for those of you who mm -hmm. aren't familiar, um, Gabby Petito was a young white woman in her early 20s who was traveling across national state parks with her partner. And then she went missing. She was disappeared. And eventually, as the story plays out in the media, it was her fiance who did it. And then all of these other news articles started coming out talking about conversations he had with his family and other concerns associated with the case. And since that was one case, it really did dominate so much of the local and the national media at the time. And understandfully so, several um, women of color scholars and activists were quoted in the news saying, we understand that this is a tragedy, but also why isn't the news covering missing murdered indigenous women as much? Why isn't it covering um, the murdering or the disappearances of black and brown women in the United States, so on and so forth. 
And it was one small example that I think highlighted a lot of the issues associated with how violence against women is covered just more broadly in the U.S. Right. Um, you made me think, uh, this, I, I'm going to interject this, uh, you, you made me think of uh, one of the best newspaper front pages I ever saw uh, was when I was in Ireland. I can't remember what year it was, but it was early 2000s when uh, Charles and Camilla were getting married. <laughs> and so that was dominating all of the news. That was all anybody was talking about in any of the papers, right. the tabloids, whatever. And um, I happened to grab uh, a copy of The Independent and the big headline across the top says, here's the news you might have missed. And so literally nothing about Charles and Camilla. <laughs> here's right. what's going on with Shen Fen and <laughs> like all of these things that people may actually need to know about. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's it, right? When you have <laughs> this one topic dominating everything, I always tell my students, what else are you missing, right? Where right. else are you going to get news to help you kind of complete your news uh, smorgasbord tray, if you will, right? Like the whole tray right. shouldn't just be Charles and Camilla or Gabby Petito. What else is going on there that we're right. not aware of? So, um, here's a question I have, and, and I almost hate to ask it because I sort of know where this is going to go. <laughs> so, when, when violence against women of color is portrayed, uh, it's portrayed in a, in a different way than uh, when violence is uh, against, when it's violence against white women. Um, mm. How does that tend to play out? Oh, goodness. <laughs> so it's, it's like you start big, right? And then the levels just just keep going yeah. down and it keeps spiraling in wild ways. Um, oftentimes you see more instances of desensitization and the framing of it as an isolated event, which again, distances it from the structural issues of like racism and violence that are always at the top. And then it is oftentimes framed as spectacle as well. So you see it diametrically opposed to um, kind of the framing as white women as victim or good victim, if you will. Um, and even in some of my work that I've done with um, Dr. Sarah de los Santos Upton at the University of Texas at El Paso, um, some of the work that we've done looking at reproductive feminicides or violence against women in reproductive spaces the spectacle is grand. And I always talk about this with my students in media ethics, trauma-informed journalism, visual communication theory, because it happens at multiple levels that I think untrained audiences aren't necessarily attuned to thinking about, right? So when you're thinking about the framing in the headline, when you're thinking about the framing throughout the article, the words that are used, and then the images that are used, right? Um, one of the cases I always show students is um, the case of Jenny Seba, a Mexican woman, a young woman who was murdered when she was pregnant. And the circumstances were traumatic and heartbreaking and also made to be spectacle. And there was a framing of a headline that then chained out in different news outlets transnationally that called it the case of the womb raiders. And I remember thinking to myself, like how horrific that is, right? That you see womb raider rhetoric or framing turning out not just in different spaces throughout Latin America, but internationally as well. And then there were also some images in the news articles that showed um, like parts of the body or parts of the crime scene. Some of the areas were blurred out, some of them weren't and so on and so forth. And then you think to yourself, right, what's the point of seeing the violence visually represented? What sort of um, outcome or goal is the sensationalized rhetoric and the headline helping, right? What does that serve and so on and so forth? And I mean, violence against women is just generally covered problematically, but then you start to see how it gets a little worse and a little more traumatic in other contexts. So um, we we've been going we've been going down some dark roads, um, but places that we need to go and look at. Um, I wanted to ask you, and I've asked this of uh, some of our other uh, guests. 
you work in a field that looks at some of the worst things um, out there, some of the best, uh, worst things that we do as a society um, and as individuals. Um, how do you stay sane? How do you keep from falling into despair as this you know, keeps happening and we keep calling it out and we keep working on it and we keep uh, reporting on it um, and we're still faced with this? Yeah, I, I love that question for a few different reasons. I always tell people when they ask me at gatherings or parties, what do you do? What do you research? I'm like, do you really want to know? I mean, I can give you the sanitized short version. I can give you the ins and outs. Um, you might think I'm a little crazy after that. But um, a few things keep me going. So first and foremost, um, I love working with students on these topics, particularly as we think through the necessity of how these stories need to be told, but how we can tell them in more humane, culturally informed, ethically informed ways. I mean, that's that's really what's kept me going this entire time. It's one of the reasons I didn't just completely throw my love for journalism out the window many, many years ago. Um, but um, something else too that is funny, maybe is the case with other folks who do research on violence, um, I actually really enjoy violence at multiple levels. And hopefully that doesn't get taken out of context. But what I mean by that is um, I don't just research it, but I always tell people that I was a spooky kid and I was always drawn to horror films, sci-fi films, forensic files, true crime sorts of things before I even knew what the academic area was in this context. So I always tell people if I was better at math and science, maybe I would have gone into forensics, right? Maybe in a different life. Um, and also, um, one of the things that brings me the most joy or the most sanity is really um, rock climbing and my community. So some folks might not know, but um, I'm a co-organizer for a local queer climbing group here in Salt Lake City. And we just had our two year anniversary this Pride Month. So you know, we have monthly meetups. We partner with organizations like Black Diamond and local um, gyms and brands to help offset access issues to getting into the outdoors. Um, and like doing all of that with my partner and my friends helps me, I think, decompress and take a break. But to be completely honest, as soon as I get home from a climbing meetup, I'm probably watching Forensic Files. So, you know, it's just how it goes. <laughs> I hear you. Um, I like just like digest murder podcasts and shows all day long. And then I'm like, why am I sad? Um, but it's yeah. all good. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I fall asleep to forensic files. So like, you know, same, uh, same. we're all weirdos. Yeah. I'm law and order. We're friends. You. <laughs> I love law and order. Yeah. <laughs> um, so before we go, um, can you give our viewers some say like search terms and resources that you think would be helpful if yeah. someone wants to look into the news coverage of violence against women and um, the relationship with other topics like re uh, reproductive health and justice? Yeah, so there's um, a ton of great resources out there in trauma-informed journalism spaces if you're interested maybe in the content creation route. Um, if you're more interested in um, audience reception, sorts of critical thinking things. I mean, media literacy, news literacy is always the way to go. We can't hype it up enough. Um, there's a ton of organizations that are free online just through a simple Google search, right? Media literacy, if you want to test your own media literacy ideas, maybe have some good um, topics to share with friends because media literacy starts with us, right? It is a burden. We take something I am always talking about with my parents and my in-laws and everything else, share the good word of media literacy. Um, and also when we think about um, reproductive justice, there are several amazing organizations that are doing the work and putting in the time. So like Sister Song, for example, California Latinas for Reproductive Justice. Um, there's also one I might fudge up the name a little bit, um, the National Institute for Latina Reproductive Justice as well. Um, and also look at which reproductive justice organizations are working in your community and then find out how you can help because I promise you, they can likely always need more volunteers. Yeah. Thanks for all of those. Those were perfect, man. You're like <laughs> pumping up media literacy. I'm like getting hype. My heart's beating fast. It's okay. <laughs> <I'm> like, <"Whoa." laughs> 
And that's yeah, a good thing because that's all the time we have with you today, Leah. Thank you so much for being on the show. And uh, Thank we you may for having you, me. You, yeah, it was a good discussion. We may uh, we may have to have you back sometime. <laughs> Can't <Cool>. wait. <laughs> all right. And now to help us think better about how to do more research on this topic, we head over to Joshua and Paris with Check This Out. Hey, welcome back. I'm all like worked up from that conversation earlier. It was super awesome. So um, I'm Paris and this is my co-host, Joshua. Everybody. Perfect. And uh, this time on Check This Out, we're going to continue to cover the media literacy process that um, we started out with Brad Serber's episode discussing um, targeted violence. And we're going to expand our search to include violence against women and coverage in the news. So we just got some amazing advice from Dr. Hernandez. So let's uh, continue with those pearls of wisdom, if we may. Um, Let's start off by revisiting our first step, um, which is where we spoke about gathering our search terms from our own experiences. Um, also, the review or two conversations that we have and even laws or victims names that correlate to the topic. Several of them were actually covered earlier. So feel free, to, feel free. why am I tongue twisted right now? Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> feel free to revisit. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of terms and some that, uh, for example, I wasn't familiar before. Um, and so one of the things that we talked about before is you can start off with general terms um, that you know from before, that you've watched, that you've heard, anything like that. Um, and just remember that as you learn more and more about those uh, topics, you're gonna need more nuanced uh, terms. Yeah. So you're gonna need phrases that are a little more specific. Um, you're going to be looking at things like uh, the cases that Dr. Leo Hernandez was mentioning and some that you see here on the search terms and strings. Um, the key, as with everything else that we've talked about uh, in media literacy and information literacy, is to keep an open mind, right? Mm -hmm. uh, take this data, think of it as context and a different perspective. Um, if it doesn't match up with what you originally thought, um, start thinking about why that might be. Um, so we have uh, a ton of uh, resources um, the one that we're going to show you next is from Dr. Leah Hernandez's talk titled News Coverage of Violence Against Women um, and uh, additional sources that include databases and access to public data. Yes, we're actually talking about that later, but oh, um, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> we're actually going to talk about um, getting started with a librarian first because um, they're perfect to help you find primary resources. We have on this all day. We're information professionals. Let us help you. Um, hopefully all the sources that you find will help you build you a help you build an informed perspective. Um, I do want to be clear. It does not have to be a librarian. It can be your local historian. Um, Leah mentioned local organizations. It could be a faculty team member who does research in that topic or even archive images. All of these are sources and all of these have a value and context that you will need to analyze, you know? Yeah, no, um, it's it's really funny. Once you start digging into something, um, your, your stance on something that you thought was super fixed, you're like, oh yeah, I know what this is about. I know, I know what's going on. And all of a sudden you just find all of this information that makes you, you know, take a step back, reconsider Think of all those conversations where you said stuff that maybe wasn't so right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, right. Um, I have a particular thing that sticks out in my mind where one time I repeated information about like the Weasley twins from Harry Potter. And I was like, they're not twins, but like obviously uh, they are. But whatever information source I took in and I didn't evaluate in my brain, I didn't critically think about it. And I ended up on the other side of that being like totally embarrassed because the answer is yes, the Weasley twins are twins in real life. But anyways, um, <laughs> that's why you can't believe everything that you read. So. Yeah. This leads us to evaluating these resources, okay? Um, so this is our last slide for the review. And these are some questions that you might kind of roll around in your head as you consider um, the narrative before you. So, you know, what story is being told and from what perspective, you know, what's to gain from them? You know, who benefits, who does not benefit from it? Is it the audience that they're trying to build? Um, is it a narrative from the view of a sponsor who paid for a prime spot to push a political opinion? Maybe, you know. I mean, usually, not, not to be like super cynical, but it's yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Listen here, agenda setting is real, Joshua, and that's across all media platforms. You know what I'm saying? So, um, all right. So now that we've analyzed our topic, you've organized the information into relevant sources and let the new context uh, context kind of inform your opinions. You might feel like you know a little something, be feeling yourself, and you probably want to talk about it, right? Um, you spent all these hours, you've watched uh, different news outlets and their coverage on violence on a woman. You've um, read these opinionated Twitter threads littered with articles written through biased lenses, uh, lenses declaring opinions as facts. We've all seen them. And now you want to create or kind of form an expression of your own. That's cool. But um, how and what does that look like, right? Um, so I've provided a list of things that kind of fall under media creation category, but it is not limited to. So you are familiar with most of these, such as speaking or sharing on social media, but this also includes other modalities like podcasts, like the one you're listening to right now, and creating flyers to kind of bring awareness. These are just a, a few examples of what um, creation might look like for you. And I see um, a lot of stuff in there, but the ones that I'm not seeing are visualizations. Mm -hmm. um, data has become such a big part of every conversation, whether people know what they're talking about when they say data or not. <laughs> um, and visualizations like the ones that we showed you um, in the past episode with uh, the mass killing database, um, they are also a form of creation and engagement. Um, there are ways of interacting with the people that you want to interact with, expressing yourself, um, and participating in the conversation. Mm -hmm. So um, no matter the, the modality of these, and we, we kind of alluded to this, and people say something's data and it's not data, just like somebody says something is a factual recording and it is completely bogus. Yeah. Uh, it is your responsibility to um, take ownership of your creation, to make sure that what you are doing is ethical, that you're sharing information that's truthful, that you're not trying to mislead, or that you're not being um, just a little lazy and not, not going all the way through, not watching that documentary all the way through, making sure you know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, sharing your thoughts on a blog, participating in the journalism process by interacting uh, with a news source through something like comments, um, even making a post to build awareness and enact change. All of these are ways of participating through different modalities that are available to most of us, right? Uh, but you do have to ask yourself some key questions, right? Um, and when you um, are looking at these possibilities, you're looking at the ways that you want to interact, um, and Paris already started with some of this, is this fact or is this just something that sounds right to me? Um, or is this something else? Uh, maybe I just like writing fiction, right? Uh, what are my sources of information? Uh, where am I getting my stuff? Um, is it um, varied enough? Is it um, coming from sources? Is it citing other sources? Um, is it radically different than everything else that I'm reading? Yeah. Um, how might people uh, that are different to me or just different groups of people generally understand this message differently? Always, 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 who is benefiting from uh, the message, right? Who are you trying to benefit by you creating whatever it is that you're creating? Um, most importantly, who might be hurt by this? Um, that should be, in my opinion, where you start off, right? Um, is this respectful? Um, are you being a good citizen, both online and in the world? If you are engaging, what actions do you want people to take in response to your message? What are you actually calling people to do? Yeah. Um, what are the ideas, values, information, or points of view? Um, are they clear? Are you thinking that you're saying something and maybe um, it's not coming across exactly as you wanted it to be? Um, and last, what is left out of whatever it is that you're creating and why might it be important for you to acknowledge that you know this isn't a full accounting of everything. This is one particular version of something that I want to create. 
Yeah, perfect. So the last step in this media literacy process is known as action, which you just spoke to uh, spoke about. And this is basically a culmination of the first few steps, which were um, accessing, analyzing, and evaluating. But now you're taking on this media um, literacy perspective and how you act or the call to action you request um, as a now informed citizen. So acting looks like um, these examples can include, you know, sharing voting information um, about upcoming topics on the ballots and the locations. It can be engaging in thoughtful conversation that critically analyzes, uh, say, dispropor uh, disproportionate news coverage of one demographic in comparison to another. Um, it looks different for everyone. And you can even point them our way and encourage them to walk through the media literacy process. You know, that's why we're doing this uh, part of the podcast. <laughs> Uh, so acting uh, doesn't always have to be being on the front lines. Um, you know, some people love showing up on the seven o'clock news. Uh, I would find that horrendous, but I still want to participate. Um, and so that might be through donations to a social justice organization that I support. Um, it might be adjusting your language to be more inclusive when you're having conversations with other people. Uh, it might be reposting something that you have carefully read and are for sure um, knowledgeable about uh, by the time that you repost, right? Because reposting is not bad. We do want to amplify good work, good messages that are out there. Um, and one of the easiest questions that you can ask yourself um, after you've gone through the process is, what actions would I take in response to this message? Um, how might I participate productively with this? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, productively being the key word there, right? Um, <laughs> you know, we're not encouraging y'all at all to get in these like knockdown drag out fights on social media to convince someone to like change their stance. But uh, you can act in a way that incites change using this media literacy process. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard the saying, um, don't talk about it, walk about it. But um, that's kind of what we're trying to encourage here. So if you can take action beyond, say the like button and share credible data and sources, that is a step in the right direction, in my opinion. You know. <laughs> and honestly, this might feel like a ton of work, but you've got to master the art to be able to make an impact. And that's what we want. Uh, you all that are coming to this podcast, um, everyone that's coming to us as librarians to be able to do to go beyond creation of content um, to really start inciting change among the communities um, using those credible sources and sharing your experience. Yeah, no, thank you. All right, everyone. So that basically concludes our segment. Um, we finished up our first full walkthrough of the media literacy process, and you have two related examples that cover the um, intersecting subjects of violence, uh, communication, and literacy. Uh, all these topic topics of which you can explore through the lens of media literacy. All right. Yeah, we and you, and you can tell we've covered a lot of ground today, <laughs> uh, but we'd love to hear about the sources uh, that you've looked at. Um, if you put this into action already, uh, we would love for you to, I don't know what it is on Instagram. Is it at us? Is it just DM, DM us? I think it's, yeah, I, <laughs> I need to look at other podcasts to see what they say. I think it's just at FYR pod. I think that's how just, you. Yeah, but it's <laughs> at FYR pod. Right, that's yeah. it's just one word. Yeah, that's just one word, no underscore anything. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Yeah, so please follow us and share your thoughts. Until next time, though, y'all, holla. <laughs> All right, that is a wrap on another episode. Do y'all have any parting words for our audience? Nah, I'm uh -huh. glad to be moving past <laughs> the violence here lately. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, good talk, Lou. It was a fantastic episode. Thank you, everyone, for participating, and thank you all for watching. We'll see you next time. Yeah.